Morning, Brandon. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can. Morning. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, interview you. Sure. I'm Greg Nedved. I'm the president of the museum, National Museum of Language. So first of all, I just want to, for the for people that will be looking at this recording later on, I just want to just make a basic announcement. Uh, you know, you're Brandon Locke, and you are the director of World Languages and Immersion Programs for the Anchorage School District, Anchorage, Alaska. And among the things that you're involved with, all of them very impressive, is you're supporting dual language immersion programs in multiple languages, mm -hmm. language and cultural preservation for indigenous peoples, uh, the Star Talk Project. You're involved in regional and national language advocacy activities. And you also are one of our Language Leadership Council uh, representatives. You are the representative from the state of Alaska. Uh, I guess we'll just start from the top. Can you tell us about your foreign language background? Sure. Well, um, my own background, uh, I was a, a French student. I started learning French um, back in seventh grade, um, studied it throughout uh, high school and college. Um, I was a high school exchange student in Switzerland um, during college, which I technically graduated from the University of Alaska Anchorage, but I spent a significant amount of time um, studying at Laval University in Quebec City, Canada. So I lived in Quebec for quite a while um, and, then, and then returned to Anchorage and did my student teaching and I became a French teacher. And I taught middle school French and high school French for about 10 years. Um, and then I um, left the teaching arena and I went into administration and I was a, uh, a middle school assistant principal and then an elementary principal. Um, and I did that for about seven years. And then I've and then my current position came open about nine years ago. And so I've been in this in this role since then. Um, so my, my, you know, my personal background was just studying French and, um, and then teaching French. I also have been connected with the Concordia language villages in Minnesota okay. um, for about 20, going on 23 years now. Um, and that is a, a language and culture immersion sort of summer camp for kids. And um, I was a, a staff member at Lac du Bois, the French village for two years. And then I became the Dean, which is the director of the program. Um, I did that for six years. And, um, and then I took a little hiatus for two years and, I, and then I returned and I'm still involved um, in uh, professional development for teachers. So not, not staff of the language villages, but um, we, we offer a master's in education um, for anyone really that that wants to come and um and it's in world language instruction but the unique piece about this program is that the students in the program have access to the language villages where they go and watch the watch participate observe um you name it uh with the with aspects of what's happening in the language villages okay uh, you're working on your doctorate mm -hmm. uh, the focus and if you don't mind telling us why are you focusing on that particular area? Sure, so really the focus of my dissertation is um, indigenous language revitalization in urban settings and its perceptions about that um, through, you know, uh, it's an ethnographic study with, you know, um, comments and such from stakeholders throughout the, the, not only the city of Anchorage, but also other folks outside lawmakers, um, people that, that make political decisions and then potentially get funding for. So one of our, one of our um, senators in DC, Lisa Murkowski, was one of the folks that was very, very instrumental in getting uh, congressional funding to start, not, not our program, but uh, uh, the grant that we, that we, um, that we were awarded. Hmm. Okay, great. Let's talk about uh, uh, the Star Talk initiative because you're involved with that in Alaska. How did 
you get involved with that? Was that Dr. Murray contacting you directly? I have two different camps that I'm in with with uh, with Star Talk, or was in with Star Talk. You know, every year it's a every year it's a new adventure because you have to apply for a grant, and you know. Um, so my first involvement was actually through the language villages. I mentioned to you that I was I'm a faculty member with their master's program, but before that, I. Um, I was their Star Talk director. So, and that was a year yearly thing, again, depending on if we were awarded the grant. But um, because of the uniqueness of the program of Concordia Language Villages, where we offer languages like Korean, Chinese, Portuguese, Arabic, um, Chinese, Russian, uh, I we would write grants to, um, to host teachers and do teacher professional development in those critical languages with the access to the language villages and, and, and seeing those programs in person. Um, and so that turned into, um, I'm sorry, that, that was a, we, we created a graduate level course called um, Second Language and Immersion Methodologies. And that was a StarTalk funded course for many years. Um, in the, it, actually, in the, the past couple of years, we weren't funded and I'm not quite sure why, but, um, but simultaneously, we were doing uh, Chinese immersion um, through StarTalk here in Anchorage um, because we, had a, we have a school that is now our Mandarin Chinese immersion school. But before that, um, the school had a FLES program. And FLES is, it's, it stands for foreign language in the elementary school, but it's basically a, a, like a pullout. So like, you know, Mrs. Jones's class goes to art on these days and gym on these days and library here and Chinese here. And it's, it's really just a, like a quick 30 minute whatever. Um, and we use the StarTalk program to help really build momentum and um, build uh, a repertoire, <laughs> I can't say that, sorry, um, in, uh, with materials and such to help us build our, our Chinese immersion program. And so now, and that, that's been, you know, we, we've been doing that for, gosh, I wanna say 11 years now. Um, did our last one last, this past summer and, uh, and it's worked because our, we are up to grade five right now in immersion and those kids are gonna be transitioning to middle school next year. Okay, great. Let's talk then about uh, our museum. Mm -hmm. uh, you're a state liaison and what, what, you know, what attracted you to this position serving as a state liaison for the National Museum of Language? To be honest with you, I didn't know that the museum existed, and Laura reached out to me, right. and and um, and I mean, she she knew me through through Star Talk, and so she she told me about this and asked if I would be willing to do it, and I said yes. Um, you know, Alaska is a, a huge huge state um, geographically, but yes. population wise, pretty small, and. Um, and I'm the only person in the state that has a job like I do. Like there's no other school district that has a director of world languages. And um, I don't know if you're familiar with Necessful, but Necessful is the, the Association of State Supervisors of World Languages. And we do not have one of those um, in our Department of Education in Alaska. So by default, I kind of do that role. And so I'm, I'm kind of like the the go-to language guy, if you will, for, for Alaska. And so just that connection plus, or excuse me, that, that sort of role plus my connection with Laura led me to this. Well, what do you think should be the proper role of a language museum? How can it best serve the greater community out there? Well, I think that the role of the museum really needs to encompass the, um, the first people, the people that were here long before the colonists came and that includes you know 
the the many many indigenous languages of what people like me call the lower 48 as well as Alaska and Hawaii and then we have to look at the um, you know obviously English but then you know, there were, there were waves of immigrants, you know, early on with the, the Germans and the Scandinavians and the Irish. And, right. and, and in, in recent years, you know, folks from, from Asia and Africa. And, and so really there's no one language and, and nobody ever insinuated that. But my point being that we've got, we've got a really rich history of language and culture in what we call the United States today. And so I think that the role really needs to, to the, of the museum really needs to, to document and highlight those, those different arenas, you know, the, the indigenous group, the, um, the colonist group, the, the um, immigrants that have, have, have come in over time and really, highlight the, the, the vast, vast language um, arena that, that, that exists here. Well, I can tell you that uh, language preservation, things like that you know, are, are very important to us. Okay. While we're on the topic of the United States, um, what do you think the country does well in terms of language? You know, what, what does it do well language wise? And then what does it not do so well language wise? What it does well is there are funding opportunities um, that exist, but they're all, most of them are grants. And so if you're trying to start or, or enhance a language program, typically you have to go outside of your very own like district or state uh, school district that is, or state to um, try to get funding so that you can offer something. Um, and I, 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 it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword because the, you know, I'm very, very proud of our UPIC program um, and what we've been able to do, but the documentation and the paperwork is, out of control. It's, it is so much work to show that we're making progress with these kids in this program that I can tell you we're making progress with these kids in this program because it's amazing. But our society overall, I don't think values languages. Um, you know, you go to any other country in the world and people speak multiple languages and it's just a part of life. And so, you know, we, 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 we may as an individual or as a collective group say, yeah, I mean, yeah, of course it's, it's important to be bilingual or multilingual, but we don't put money where our mouth is. It's tiring to try to defend the importance of speaking another language in this country. And by that, I don't mean the people that, you know, may, um, that, that come to the country or that we're here, but have a different first language and are learning English. I'm talking about the, the mainstream um, monolingual English speakers that don't see the value in learning another language. The, you're next to Canada there. I know specifically British Columbia, the Yukon Territory, et cetera. What are the Canadians doing differently language-wise than the Americans? Well, Canada is officially a bilingual country. Um, and so, and that's actually where immersion started. So oh. the whole purpose, well, what we know as immersion education today came from Canada in the 1960s. And it oh, was- Did it not was, know that. Yep, and it was strategically developed to cross pollinate the two languages. Um, so, you know, the vast majority of the French speaking Canadians live in the province of Quebec, which is on the East Coast, but there are pockets in like Manito Manitoba and in Eastern territory or uh, provinces like Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, but the vast majority of Canadians speak English. 
And so, um, you know, Ontario all the way to the West is predominantly English speaking, but they have a lot of French immersion programs. And, um, and, and same within Quebec, Quebec has English immersion programs. And so the, the, the immersion programs that we have in the US are, are really truly modeled after the Canadian model. Oh, okay. But, um, but, you know, I'm not familiar with other immersion programs in Canada, but their, their whole goal with immersion was really just to provide that um, linguistic educational opportunity for their entire population to speak both of their official languages. Canada is also similar to the United States, um, a, a country with a lot of indigenous peoples. And just like in the United States, it's also relatively new in having those languages become revitalized. And a lot of that work is grassroots effort by the indigenous peoples. And, and I say that for both countries. And the unique thing about um, the, the indigenous languages is that there are pockets like in, in Alaska, like, you know, the, the language doesn't stop at the border. There, there are indigenous folks that, that, are, that speak a specific language and those languages cross over between Alaska and the Yukon Territory, for example, or between British Columbia and Washington State. Let's talk about Alaska, you know, which you're most, most familiar with. What's the biggest problem facing Alaska language students and instructors, in your opinion? Well, First of all, there's a huge teacher shortage in this country, or just, teachers in general. There's also a huge language teacher shortage in this country. And then you, you intensify that even more by um, trying to entice people to move to Alaska. Well, I'm from here. Alaska is where I live. I mean, Really, if you, if you superimpose, if you put the state of Alaska on top of the United States, it goes from the top of North Dakota all the way down to Texas. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. And so that's, you know, when, when people say, well, what's, you know, what's the weather like there? Well, that's like saying, well, what's the weather like in the United States? I mean, Florida has much different weather than North Dakota. People don't realize that. And so when you're trying to convince somebody to move here that's never been here before, they, I think, typically think of barren terrain, people living in igloos, um, you know, moose and bear. And that's, that's not what this is all about. I mean, in, I mean, even in Fairbanks and Juneau, but, but in Anchorage, we're a big city. Our, our district has about 50,000 students. And we have over 100 home languages spoken by our student population. Um, but then in our district, you know, we teach. We have, I have seven languages in eight immersion programs. Uh, and then in addition to that, we have the traditional non-immersion language programs, French, German, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, ASL. Um, and, and then to make it even more unique, you know, with, with all of the ELL students in, in the state, as well as the, the languages that we're teaching, we have, like I said earlier, 23 official indigenous languages. And that's the hard part because just because they're an official language doesn't mean that there is a plethora of speakers of that language. And so, um, and not all of the languages are written and so it's, it's, it's a really hard thing to do when you want to be equal and equitable across the board with the different indigenous groups. Um, but how do you tell somebody, well, there's not very many speakers of your language, so that's not really important, but Yupik has a lot more, so that's where we're, that's where we're focusing. That's a, that's a tough thing to say. Um, but the reality is, we can't do justice to every language that's here. We just can't. I mean, it's, it's impossible. Well, you don't um, have the same resources. No, they nor don't no. have the languages, you know, if there's no, so, no dictionaries, no books, no, you know, no, yep. 
language, it's going to be very difficult. Exactly. Exactly. Arguably yeah. impossible. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. I, you may have covered this already because you were talking about the language of Alaska. But what are the top five languages? So in I, I, I can't say for the entire state, but in the Anchorage School District, after, after English and Spanish, the top languages that are spoken by our students are, um, and, and I'll just tell you the top five. I don't, I'm not sure exactly which one. Which <laughs> I don't know the, the numbers, the right? Order, right. Okay, so um, Samoan, Hmong, uh, Filipino or Tagalog, Yupik, and Korean. Okay. Um, Samoan, I think, is a little surprising, at least to me. Hmong, I think, is a Southeast Asia. Yep. Yeah, Samoan is a, is a surprise to me a little bit. We have a lot of Samoans, a lot of Samoans, and a lot of Pacific Islanders that live here. And it's interesting. I did not know that. Yeah. And what's, what's fascinating about it is that they often still dress as they would if they were in the South Pacific. And, uh, you know, temperature wise is, 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 it's an interesting thing to see. But yes, I, and I'm not quite sure why, what the draw is, but yes, we have a very large South um, Pacific Islander population here. Okay, are teachers, and I, I know the answer to this already, teachers in Alaska, uh, how are they in terms of pay with the other, ranking them with the other states? I'm going to assume teachers in Alaska, and of course this would include language teachers, get paid more than teachers in other states simply because of the location. Um, well, that used to be the case for Anchorage. That's not the case anymore. I think teachers in Anchorage are still paid well, but not well enough. I mean, they, they definitely, teachers across the board deserve more money, but, um, yeah. but, teachers outside of Anchorage out in what's called Bush, Alaska, or the villages, um, a lot of times they are paid well, um, but, and, and, and many times often are provided housing. But when you go to the grocery store to buy a gallon of milk, it costs $7. Right. I mean, the, the cost of things are, you know, you go to a place like Costco and you get a 24 pack of bottles of water for two ninety nine. dollars Well, it's $23 in Barrow. I mean, it's just insane. And so, so yeah, you might be earning more, but you're also spending more. Uh, okay, Brandon, we've covered all the questions that I have. At this point, you know, is there anything you want to bring up that I haven't asked you? Anything you feel that needs to be said? Anything no, to clarify? I, anything you want to add? I think I'm good. I, I appreciate this opportunity and I think the museum is a, a really unique entity and um, I, I, I've i enjoyed participating thus far and I think it's, it's really cool. It's really exciting to see liaisons from across the country. And I just think it's a really great thing to bring people together to talk about, celebrate, you know, endorse uh, the, the, the different languages that make up this country. Thank you very much, Brandon. Good meeting you. Thank you for your work with the museum and uh, best luck, to, uh, best luck with your, you know, on your doctorate. All right. You have a great day. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye.